uh, ways of doing layout via CSS. Um, the idea is, you know, here's what I would here's what I would hope. All right, let's put it that way. <clears throat> you have a number of assignments where you have to make two versions of the same page. All right. My hope is is that you try each of these, not necessarily each of these, but you try some different ways of doing it. In other words, when you have to make two versions of the page, don't like make just like make one red and one blue or something like that. Really try to radically change the layout. Remember what we saw with CSS Zen Garden, how you can change every aspect of the page via CSS. So you can make it look totally different. You can make it look where it doesn't even look like it's the same page, simply by changing the CSS. So my goal is that if I look at those two pages, they look completely different. And one way that you can achieve that is by changing the way that it's laid out. And we've studied a number of different techniques for laying it out, right? We studied the flow layout by just tweaking the margins and stuff like that. And we still made it look good with that format. We've studied uh, fixed position, or I'm sorry, absolute positioning. We also studied fixed positioning. Uh, we study relative positioning. And today I think we'll hit two more. We'll probably get through both of these. Um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but we're going to study uh, something that's pretty new in CSS, and that is what's called a grid layout. By new, I mean that it was uh, implemented with um, CSS3. It's a feature of CSS3. So it's a feature of the newer version of CSS. And the last thing that we're going to look at is called floating uh, layouts. And, uh, and that's what we'll do today. So I have uh, an example of grid layout that I'll pull down. This I have to say, I'm because it's newer, I'm a little less familiar with it. So I'm playing it safe and instead of creating it on the fly, I already have a finished version. That way I don't have to worry about it. I always think it's like, I'm like the, the TV chefs, right? Where the TV chefs like will start making a turkey and they'll go away from commercial and they'll come back and like the turkey's already cooked, you know. It's like they already have a finished one in the oven just ready to pull it out. Well, this is my finished one that was in the oven. CSS grid layouts. Actually, I lied. This is a resource about CSS uh, grid layouts. Here's more about grid layouts. And I hope I do have that turkey in here. Let's see. This is an example of a grid layout. Let me copy it to the desktop. All right. In this one, it looks like this. All right. Notice how those things are laid out in a grid. All right. What do we mean by a grid? A grid is like, you know, something that has rows and columns in it. Um, grids are very popular on both websites and in other forms of graphic design, like magazines and books and all that. A lot of times you have things laid out in a grid that has a certain number of rows, a certain number of columns in it. So it was natural for web designers to want to have a grid in CSS. All right? 
But interestingly enough, until CSS3, there was not necessarily an easy way to do a grid. Uh, back in the old, old, old days, people used tables for this. Some of you that might have done HTML a long time ago know that you use tables to do layout back in the old days. Well, now we don't do that anymore. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't use tables to just make your page be laid out a certain way. You should use tables for what they were intended for, like a table of data, like cities and the average temperature for the months of the year, you know, where you have rows and columns of data. This we're using a grid, but we're using a grid just to achieve the layout. <clears throat> I think I mentioned the site Can I Use, which shows us um, how compatible certain things are, how compatible browsers are for HTML5 and CSS3. Uh, um, so if I say grid layout, you'll notice that just about any web browser other than the Opera Mini browser supports grid layouts. Internet Explorer sort of supports grid layouts. That's what the slightly different shade of green means. Um, the, the brighter the green, the, the more heavily that it supports it. So you're pretty safe to use that. Going back, iOS Safari um, was released in September of 2016. It didn't support it, but what was released in March uh, of 2017 does support it. One thing that's nice about this site is, I don't know if you noticed when I first loaded the site up, it said that it noticed, it detected that we were in the United States, that I want to load the usage statistics for the United States. Uh, that can be useful um, because what it does is it loads the percentage of people that use a certain browser. So, for example, if I wanted to use a grid layout, really the problem areas are this one, this one, this one, and maybe that one. All right? And I can look to see what percentage of people that comprises. So 0.11% of people use Opera Mini. Well, that's not really that many. 1.9% um, use this version of uh, iOS, uh, Safari. So we're probably up to 2% of the people. Another percent and a half, we're at 3.5%. Another 2.5, we are up to 6% of the people use browsers that don't completely support this. Um, is that a problem? Well, it still constitutes a good number of people. I mean, it's only 6%, but 6% of the entire U.S. population is pretty big, right? Would you want to create a store that 6% of the people just couldn't visit because, uh, the, you know, I don't know, the way the, you know, the door was too short and like people that are above a certain height would bang their heads or something like that. I don't know. That's a really dumb example, but you get the idea, you know. You wouldn't want to build restrictions into a physical store, so you wouldn't build a restriction into a website. So what you have to do with things like this is, and we'll talk more about this later on, is, is we can look to see the good news uh, about the way browsers work is if they don't understand something, they ignore it. All right? So, if you try to use a grid layout on an old browser that doesn't understand it, it will actually um, just ignore it and display it as um, the flow layout, which is probably not bad. Let's see if we can download the Opera Mini just for, just for laughs. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is. I think Opera is for. Yeah, for mobile devices. There is an Opera Mini emulator, though. There we go. And we are on Windows, right?
here's the Opera emulator. Let's go and drag. Remember, this is emulating a mobile device, so that's why it's so small. We can accept that. And I'm going to drag over index for this. And sure enough, it displayed it as though it was a flow layout. All right. Um, there's a word for that, and it's kind of a goofy phrase, but it's called graceful degradation. In other words, if you are using a browser that doesn't support a certain feature, <laughs> and it and the page still works, at least is usable, let's put it that way, when I say the page works, it's usable, then you can say that the page gracefully degrades. In other words, even if, that, even if you don't have the newest browser, it's still going to work. Now, we don't get the nice grid layout that we wanted here. All right. We wanted it to look like this, where the stuff is side by side, and instead we get this. But at least it works. You can see the links and so on. All right. This will be important because one of the things that we're going to talk about in an upcoming class is uh, browser compatibility and testing for browser compatibility and, and things of that nature. All right. Let's look at the, the code that actually does this. Yes? Did you, like, make it so that uh, if, for example, out for many, if it dis uh, displayed, like, the grid layout, there was, like, an alternate CSS layout that it would use? Yes, you can. Um, Yes, yes, you can. Um, there are ways that you can specify under certain uh, under certain conditions to use one style sheet or another, and that's used a lot of the times when you get to mobile versions of a website. That so you can say that if it's on a mobile device, use style sheet B instead of style sheet A. If you're on a desktop computer, use style sheet A. All right, so. Yeah, there's there's ways uh, there, there's ways that you can do that. There's ways just in CSS that you can do that. There's also ways if you combine JavaScript or server-side scripting that you can do the same thing. So yes, uh, that's one of the reasons uh, again why we focus on doing everything about the appearance in CSS because then you can swap out CSS files easily. Um, even uh, some sites allow you to sort of uh, customize the site. Right, uh, I think Canvas does. I'm not sure, but like you can pick a color scheme that works for you or whatever. A lot of some sites offer that functionality, and yeah, I mean it's nice to be able to have it and pick the colors that you like better. But for some people that like have vision issues, the color can really be critical, especially if they're they're colorblind. You know, they can pick colors that are going to help them see and identify stuff better. So it's more than just making it look prettier for the individual. It actually can increase the functionality of the site if you can customize it. That whole thing starts by having no things about the appearance in HTML, having everything about the appearance in CSS, because then you can just swap out those files. And you have the same page, and it just looks different with the same content. All right, so let's look at this. Start by looking at the HTML, which is not much to look at, not much different than what we did before, with one exception. We have this div with an ID of wrapper. All right? Wrapper with a W, not with an R. All right? So I'm not about to spit some rhymes here. All right? When we use a wrapper in that context, it means it sort of wraps around the section that we want to do something special with. All right? So in this case, this wrapper goes around all the main sections of the page. All right? In this way, we could maybe make a portion of the page have a grid layout and a portion of the page not have a grid layout, for example. So we would wrap up into a nice little container, the part of the page that we wanted to treat as a grid, and we could have other stuff outside of that section. In this particular case, I want everything to be part of the grid. So 
the wrapper goes around literally everything. All right, so let's look at the CSS for this. All right, I have a lot of the things are the same, and really, all I do to achieve the grid is to say that that wrapper section I want to treat as a grid. So I say display colon grid. I specify the grid gap. So the grid gap is the space between the things in the grid, sort of like a margin, right? And then I specify how wide the templates, the, the, the columns are. So in this case, I make the, the columns 400 by 400 pixels. So if I look at this, I have 10 pixels between the things. Let me close some of these. And each one of these is 400 pixels wide, which means that as I resize it, it doesn't resize the things because I've given them, doesn't re, 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 uh, resize the grid uh, pieces because I've specified that the width is 400 pixels. Now this is just about as simple of a grid as you can get. Where you have um, you define an area as being your grid, you say how many columns you have, and you say how wide each column is. So if I kept adding stuff to the HTML here, here. It's going to display these still on the grid and it's just going to keep to two of them side by side. So if I go and change that and look at it, it just makes the grid going on down. So it puts them two side by side. So a grid would be good if you needed like columns for your If you page. wanted to be right in neat columns. Okay. Exactly. And there's a lot of websites that do that. Let's see if I can find one off the top of my head. I guess PN might do that. that we've visited in class, because I know I've seen a few examples of these. All right, here's an example, sort of. Like here they have sort of three columns side by side, and so on. So yeah, absolutely, if you want to have neat columns. And if you think about that, you know, there's a lot of times when you might want to have that. You know, you might want to have that for a photo gallery, right? If you have a photo gallery of pictures, you might want to have them to be arranged in a grid. Or news articles that were um, of similar value, of similar importance. You might want to have a grid of those, and so on. So grids are very popular. I can change it by just changing the layout of the grid here, so I could say maybe the first column is 
400, the second column is 200, and the third column is 200 pixels. And now instead of having um, two columns per row, it's going to have three columns per row. Mike, you forgot the uh, semicolon. Uh, it's generally forgiving if you have no oh, semicolon. Okay, sorry. That's all right. So there it put them three by three, and it made the one bigger because um, I specified that and so on. Now, there's all kinds of things that you can do beyond this, right? I just want to sort of introduce this to you and give you an opportunity to play. Right? The lab is what? What are labs in other classes? In, 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 let's say, a chemistry class or whatever. The lab's a chance for you to experiment, right? So experiment with these things. Play around with them. See what happens. Um, here is a complete guide to GRID, and it shows you what you can do. You can sort of have a GRID where one of the items covers multiple columns and multiple rows. So it doesn't have to be an even grid, right? It doesn't have to be where every piece of the grid is the exact same width and height. You can, like, have this column or this item actually covers two, three, four, goes from, uh, covers column two, three, four, and it has a row start and a row end. I'm feeling lucky today, so let's try to change this. I'm going to make my header I'm going to say grid column Start one, grid column and three. So if you notice, now that header sort of looks more like a header, right? Instead of being equal columns, it actually spans column one and two. It's kind of weird that you put the ending column as being sort of like one after the column that it ends at. I mean, I would have, I would have thought it would have been logical to say the ending column is two, right? It starts in one and ends in two. But actually, you put three because three means it ends at three and it doesn't go into three. So, I don't know. I, th I think that's kind of weird, but once you understand it, it's not that big a deal. We can do the same thing with the grid row. So, I could say grid row start. And grid row and so now it takes up two rows and two columns but everything else is arranged in a neat grid around it this is actually kind of cool <laughs> I'm kind of I'm kind of liking this all right now that I'm playing more with it I'll bet you can give percentages instead of width. So I could say maybe, we'll try this, 40%, 20%, 20%. Then as it gets smaller, it gets smaller. Oh, that's kind of ugly though, right? When it gets too small. What you can do to fix that is we could put a minimum width. I want it to be that big, but this guy, I don't want to get any smaller than 100 pixels. 
And I think that should work. So the navigation is getting smaller, getting smaller, getting smaller. It sticks at 100 pixels and doesn't get any smaller than that. Notice the other ones do get smaller. So I could put that on the sections as well. I define that they take up a certain width, but I can specify a minimum width that, hey, don't make it any smaller than this. And I could do that on the footer as well. So if I make it smaller, at a certain point, it stops. These are overlapping. I wonder why. Can you set um, restrictions on the positioning for those? Because as of right now, you've got it set so they can't be smaller than a certain size, mm -hmm. but their position is still always updated to a certain percentage of the page. Mm -hmm. um, maybe. I don't know. I'm going to try by putting a margin so that they don't overlap. Let's see if that does anything. why these are overlapping. Let's put it that way. Oh, oh, here's what we can do. I'll bet this will do it. Let's get rid of this and this and this. And I'll try putting a minimum width on the wrapper. getting a little bit of overlap with that. That's weird. I, I guess I have to say I'm not 100% sure why it's doing that. Um, but um, could be something dumb that I'm doing that I just didn't notice. Um, at any rate, that's that in a nutshell is the grid. And there's a lot more stuff that you can do. A lot more properties that you can do with that to get the grid to look any way that you want to. And these are good websites that talk about the grid view. Okay, so that's the grid view. The next thing we're going to talk about is floating. All right, and for me when I learned CSS, this was sort of the most confusing concept. So I'm going to build a, a test page first, and then I'm going to actually do it to the real page. All right? I'm going to build a test page where we can just try out some things and try out some concepts. All right? And for the test page, I'm going to... Um, just so that we can look at both at the same time. All right? Don't think that this means that, yeah, it's a good idea to put the HTML and CSS in the same file. It usually isn't. It's usually best to have separate files for them. But this being a very specific case where I want to be able to show you both of them at the same time without switching between screens, I'm going to do it that way. So let me go in and close out of these. 
and I'll create a new HTML file. Actually, I'm going to be lazy. I'm going to copy one of these. I'm just going to delete stuff from it. So I'm going to delete the, the CSS. I'm going to delete everything in the body. And I'm going to change the title to say to be float test. And I'm going to put two sections on the page. This is section one. Actually, I'm going to get Greek text for this. I changed my mind because I want a big block of text. I just don't want a couple of words. into a paragraph within my section. styling whatsoever. Without any styling of my own, how is the appearance controlled? It's controlled by the defaults of the browser. So what are the defaults of the browser? The defaults of the browser are that any block tag takes up 100% of available space. There's defaults to the padding, there's defaults to the margin, and the layout is defined as flow, which means they'll just stack on top of each other. So when we view this page, there's going to be a paragraph, a little bit below it, there's going to be another paragraph with a little bit of space, a default space. So let's save this. Background color, anyhow. 
background yellow. So now we view this. We have our two sections. It takes up 400 pixels. As I resize it, it doesn't do anything because I've used an absolute size, 400 pixels, as opposed to a relative size where if I gave something like 40% or something like that. We're going to start off doing it with an absolute number of pixels. All right? Now, here's my goal. This is the goal of floating. I'm going to want to put this alongside of this right here, if you can imagine. I want to put this second paragraph, the second section, right alongside it here. All right? As long as there's enough room to fit it. So right now, when the window's that wide, there's enough room to fit these side by side. Right? It can fit here. It'll approximately take up that space and there's enough room. Now when I make it a certain size though, there's not enough room. If I were to make it this big, there's not enough room to put this side by side. If there's not enough room to put them side by side, I want it to do this. I want the second one to drop below, down below the first one. This is called floating because these things don't have a fixed position. They sort of float around the page depending on the size of the container, the size of the window. Sometimes these are called liquid layouts, right? Um, because liquid, you know, what shape is water? You know, water doesn't have a shape. The shape of water depends on the container that it's in, all right? If you had a long, tall test tube, the water would be a long, tall, thin column uh, would be the shape of it. If you had a short, shallow, wide bowl, the water would be wide and shallow. All right? So the shape of the water uh, depends on the container that the water is in. Same thing here. The shape of the page, the way the page is going to be arranged, is going to depend on the size of the container. The container, in this case, being the window. So I'm going to put, for both of these, I'm going to say position float. Position float. All right. No, I'm not, it's not position float. My mistake. Float left. I lost my head briefly. Float left. What does float left mean? And this is a little confusing. This is probably the most confusing of all layouts, I would say. Float left means push it as far as the left as you can. And if it can fit alongside of the thing to the left of it, then great, fit it in there. If not, drop it down to the next space and float it over. So, this first one since it's the first thing on the page, it can go fl float all the way over to the left and boom, go right here. This one, because it's the second thing on the page, it wants to float to the left as long as there's space to put it alongside of this page, right, of uh, this uh, section right here. So if there's enough space, it will put it here. Otherwise, it will put it down here and push it all the way to the left. So that's what float left means. So if I save this now and look, I'm going to start with the window Y. There's enough space that it can put them side by side. Now, as I gradually make it smaller, there's going to be a point where there's not going to be enough space for them to be side by side. And when that happens, it's going to take this and pop it down here. And sure enough, it does that. Now, if we think about this, this is really cool. This might not seem cool at first, but this is really cool. And here's why. If you look at 
a magazine. I think I have a magazine in here. Got a magazine. Notice that there's two columns of text. Why do they put, in, in magazines, why do they make two columns of text? Why not just have one big column going all the way across? To save on space and paper. Save on space, maybe. I'm not sure how that would really save on space. To make it easier to read. To make it easier to read, right? Because what happens if your eye tries to go too far? Your eye has a tendency to go up or down a line. That's why sometimes people like read will put their finger underneath the word just to make sure that they keep the same line. Or I've seen like people take like an index card and put it underneath that, and that helps them read. All right. So columns uh, help people read. All right. So if you're on a wide desktop monitor, you would want this to be in columns. You wouldn't necessarily want it to be one column going all the way across because reading on a monitor has some similarities with reading on, on paper. All right? Now, let's imagine we're on a mobile device. If we're on a mobile device where the screen is oriented differently, screen is no longer wide, but it's tall and narrow, relatively, a one-column approach with a narrow column is the way that you want to go. So floating is really cool to be able to handle different situations where you might be viewing the page on a wide desktop monitor and you might want it to have multiple columns or you might be viewing the same content on a mobile device where you only want one column. So this is sort of going to dovetail into one of our next topics where we talk about mobile um, web development. Now, things can be complicated a little bit because I could add a padding to this. Right? I could add padding to put some space between the edge and the text. I could add a border. And I could add a margin. To sort of leave some gaps here. So to make it a little easier to read still. Margin is the one that uh, puts space between the lines, right? No, margin is okay. what puts space between the two different elements. So in this case, it's the space between the two sections. So now... Each one of these isn't 400 pixels wide. It's 400 pixels plus the five padding on both sides. So that's 410 pixels plus the two border on both sides. That's 414 pixels plus the 10 for the margin. Remember, the margin doesn't add up. So that is... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So now, if we were measuring at what point this breaks and it slides down below, it's going to do it a little bit earlier. All right? But the advantage is it's a little more readable. All right? So remember, when you do that, those things add up. Yes? So then on the browsers, will that make that more user-friendly? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. We can also use percentages instead of widths. You know, uh, for, for the widths, rather. In other words, instead of an absolute number, we can say a percentage. So I could say these have a width of 40% instead of 400 pixels. And then... The things resize until it gets very, very, very narrow. 
It can be a little confusing because the width is a percentage and the margin padding and border are numbers. So this becomes almost an algebra problem, like when will it break? Because that's 40% and the other ones are absolute numbers. So you could actually figure it out if you were so inclined. <laughs> All right? But I don't know. Uh, we can also just observe <laughs> and see how it works. All right? But notice it still breaks. All right? There's still a point where we can't fit them side by side when you consider that we're also adding on the padding and the margin. Yes? If you add a minimum width, would it? Oh, beautiful. We can add a minimum width to this to make sure it doesn't get too small, right? Because, face it, like, that narrow is kind of not really very usable. So what we can do is we can specify a minimum width of something that's reasonable and maybe make the minimum width 200 pixels. In which case, it'll still be that percentage, but at a certain point, it stops getting smaller. That must be 200 pixels. Let's make it a little bit bigger to make it more observable. Let's make a minimum width of 300 pixels. All right, there it's not getting any smaller. All right, that, it, it has achieved the minimum width of 300. So, it will keep it that width until it can't fit it side by side and then it drops it below. But it will never get smaller than the 300 pixels. If we were to view this in the emulator, in the browser, that doesn't look very good. We'll have, to, we'll have to study mobile development to make it a single column there. All right. Now there's a little bit more that we have to do about the floating. So we'll do that on Thursday. And then I'll actually go and finish the prototype um, using a floating method. So we'll do a little bit more on this, we'll finish the prototype, and then we'll probably start talking about more things that we can do to make the page mobile compatible. All right, um, I will go unlock the lab, then I'll come back here to get my files, and then I'll be back in the lab.